Uh, for overseas participants, good morning or good evening. I am Cecilia Chui, the founder and executive director of Innovation Forum Hong Kong. And thank you very much for joining our webinar titled The Trends of Investing in Tech Startups. For this webinar, there is a total of 180 registrations from various countries, including senior executives, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, and postgraduate students. The theme of this webinar is actually stemmed from the third annual report on Hong Kong's entrepreneurial ecosystem by KPMG China and Alibaba Hong Kong Entrepreneurs Fund. The study finds that, resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, startups, SMEs, and corporations have to re-evaluate their business models. We need to see what measures would encourage the growth of startups in different innovation and technology sectors such as artificial intelligence, robotics, smart city, and biotechnology. Also, we believe it is timely to host a webinar to discuss the trends of investing in tech startups and best practices in corporate startup collaboration in order to enrich the ecosystem. We would like to take this chance to thank Ms. Irene Chu and KPMG China for granting us the permission to build on their work and to discuss related issues at this webinar. Furthermore, the webinar is sponsored by Invest Hong Kong, which aims to strengthen Hong Kong's position as the leading international business hub in Asia. We hope this webinar would boost interests of startups and scale-ups in the UK, Europe, and other parts of the world to leverage on Hong Kong's entrepreneurial ecosystem in order to expand into China and the Asia Pacific. Indeed, we greatly appreciate the generous support of Invest Hong Kong. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Ewan Robbins, who is CEO of the Global Innovation Forum. Ewan will give a brief introduction of our organization. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Robbins. Ewan, please. Yes, thank you, Cecilia. Um, I can just share a few very quick slides quickly. Um, but no, thank you very much for the warm introduction. And it's a really pleasure to um, speak today at uh, today's event. I'm really looking forward to all the wealth of uh, speakers uh, because I think we've got a real good um, diverse set of um, speakers. We'll cover uh, quite a few different topics. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, morning for, on my side. Um, so just as a brief intro to the Innovation Forum as a whole, um, we, we are really a grassroots network of um, science entrepreneurs and um, really looking at connecting um, scientists, policymakers and industry to really drive forward innovation. And we've been in operation over seven years now and have um, active uh, members in uh, over 19 universities across the globe and have evaluated over 600 startups which have gone on to raise uh, over 100 million dollars in private equity and um, throughout our whole network we've been really um, uh, yeah really privileged to work with uh, scientists entrepreneurs uh, from across the board going from uh, therapeutics to diagnostics uh, digital health and also climate uh, tech as well. So it's really interesting um, 
to be able to present some of these things that also um, Cecilia also is uh, leading in Hong Kong and in the greater uh, Asia Pacific area, which is very much of interest to, to us. Um, so as I said, we're very active at some of the top universities uh, in the world and partnering with um, a lot of great companies which make all of this possible. Um, and part of our activities really split into the three categories being from the local activities such as uh, our workshops really looking at uh, connecting with the local ecosystems with our Imagine F competition which is really a pre-accelerator for very early stage um, ideas and connecting them with the network and uh, the expertise to be able to take their ideas forward. And finally, all this culminates in our global conference, uh, which last year was uh, over in Cambridge. Um, and this really brings uh, key opinion leaders from uh, across the industry to be able to connect with um, future leaders as well. And we really see this as a funnel to drive forward innovation um, through expert mentorship, um, and pitching uh, to industry experts and investors. So without further ado, uh, I'd uh, like to pass on to, uh, back to, um, oops, sorry. Yeah, I will introduce uh, the speakers. Yeah, thank you. Introduce the group of speakers. Um, in this webinar, we are going to have two parts. Um, there are four presentations in part one. So the first speaker is Mr. Andy Wong. Mr. Andy Wong is Head of Innovation and Technology at Invest Hong Kong. He leads a team of technology specialists with major focus on promoting and facilitating overseas investments in Hong Kong for setting up and expanding their operations in the form of sales and marketing, regional headquarters, research and development, and or innovation center. His key focused technology clusters include biotech, biomedical, medical devices, healthcare services, AI, and robotics, microelectronics, and environmental technologies. Also, Mr. Andy Wong has extensive experiences in consultancy in the Greater China. He is a chartered engineer and a chartered accountant. May I have Andy come forward? So Andy, in your position at Invest Hong Kong, would you please introduce the innovation an entrepreneurship ecosystem in Hong Kong? And what are Hong Kong's competitive advantages? How overseas companies could leverage on Hong Kong's advantages to expand into China and the Asia Pacific? We look forward to hearing your views. Andy, please. I'm Andy Wong. Uh, thank you very much for Cecilia and also Ivan for your introduction. And also thank you for Inno Forum to organize this event. Um, um, I'm very pleased to join this uh, uh, the webinar to talk about uh, more about the, uh, the innovation in Hong Kong. So let me start to share the slide first. So hold on a second. So uh, in the next uh, um, maybe 10 minutes, I will talk about, as uh, Cecilia described, about uh, what is the, uh, the innovation and technology development in Hong Kong and what is the uh, key advantage for this innovation to be happening in Hong Kong. And also I will touch on a little bit about the Greater Bay Area, the GBA, the opportunity about how does it bring the opportunity for uh, the company who start the R&D function in Hong Kong and then leverage Hong Kong and then uh, ta target or tap into the opportunity in Greater Bay Area. So uh, in my uh, presentation, I try to uh, make it in 10 minutes because I, I think that there's a lot of good stuff uh, for the other speaker. So I will try to limit my uh, speaking in 10 minutes to save the, the good content for the other speaker to talk more. Um, so um, just a quick uh, introduction about Invest Hong Kong. We are a government agency. 
So our role is to promote and attract foreign investment, setting up the business in Hong Kong. Um, the overall idea is that we try to help to bring the economy of Hong Kong um, through this uh, uh, overseas uh, company business uh, setting up in Hong Kong. And then we divide into different cluster and I look after the innovation and technologies. For um, Invest Hong Kong, we have about 31 offices all over the world. So uh, cover Europe, uh, America, Asia, et cetera. And the overall benefit for Invest Hong Kong, we are trying to uh, link, link up all those uh, different ecosystem parts, including the government, department, technology part, like the science park, cyber port, the chambers, association, incubators, investment side, and also the corporate, including the private and also the public utility research institution. And, and more important is to link up with the talent from the university. So um, just a quick um, to demonstrate the, uh, what, when people doing the business in Hong Kong, what are the advantage? First of all, Hong Kong is located in the heart of Asia. So within four or five hours flight, you can cover half of the population worldwide. And Hong Kong have a very simple and low tax system. We have no GTS and no sales tax. So in, for the uh, profit, we making less than two million. We, this, the tax rate, the profit tax rate is only 8.25, which is very low uh, in uh, globally. And then we are very strong in fundraising, the IPO fundraising in particular for uh, biomedical, we have special chapter called 18A, which uh, allow the biomedical company, which even though P revenue stage, once they pass the FDA phase one, is eligible to apply for the IPO listing under the biomedical sector. And we have a good uh, IP, a strong IP system protection, with a Bay Area and also very good um, startup ecosystem, including the investor and also the incubator available. Uh, to uh, summarize the innovation and technology in Hong Kong, uh, there are different subsectors, start with the biomedical and pharmaceutical, um, and also same as the AI robotics, um, there's a two uh, cluster called Health in Hong Kong, AI Robotics in Hong Kong, which is a program which is trying to um, combine the university in Hong Kong as well as the university globally to combine the research function together to innovate the healthcare um, sector as well as the robotic AI sector. Uh, in the under the biomedical, we have a very good healthcare system in Hong Kong, chapter 18A at the stock exchange I just mentioned, which is allow people, the company, to list their um, company over the IPO platform. We have a genomes institution set up last year in May. The idea is that we create a database with uh, uh, many database uh, of the full se genome sequencing record so that we can uh, take care of the clinical research as well as academic research, leading uh, medical school in Hong Kong, clinical trial hub in Hong Kong, and also global farmers is all in Hong Kong. So under the robotics, uh, we have a tenant from different uh, university, uh, as you all know, right? So uh, five of the university in Hong Kong is ranked the top global 100 um, globally. And also we have different government funding available R&D facility in Science Park. Uh, 5G is already available in Hong Kong and as well as in, in, in China as well. So that definitely help uh, to move on to the uh, robotics area. We have upcoming microelectronic center helping to build more uh, what we call boutique kind of a, a fabrication for the chips as well. So smart city under smart city with mo mobility, living, uh, environmental, government data, people, and also economy under smart city, telecoms network, and also big data network in Hong Kong. Um, this slide is to just to show at different stage what we can see the offering from Hong Kong. So starting from the basic research, right? So from the academic side, we have the good university I just mentioned. And in, the, in addition to this, this uh, we have the Genomes Project. We have the Hong Kong Academy of Science, which is uh, those are top-notch kind of a scientists who has come together to uh, uh, brainstorm what is needed for Hong Kong. It's advisory board for the Hong Kong government. And uh, we have different government incentives, uh, including matching fund and also some R&D cash rebate, for example. And the private sector, in, including the incubator accelerator, is all in Hong Kong. And the good healthcare system, so that it enabled the uh, clinical trial surface. And under the clinical stage, um, those uh, startups, they found that they can uh, join the incubator bio program in Science Park, as well as uh, if they do some medical device, they can also look for other research institute available in Hong Kong. Uh, clinical trial, we have the two top lot. Um, investigate uh, medical schools, Hong Kong University and also Chinese University. And uh, doing the clinical research, we have two 
you read uh, Hospital Queen Mary and also Prince of Wales Hospital, which is uh, accredited by globally and as well as the China NMPA for the clinical trial data. And the commercial size, right? As I mentioned earlier, that we have the Advanced Manufacturing Center. And in the more longer term or midterm, we have another park, is, is called Hong Kong Center Innovation and Technology Park, which is a couple of times bigger than the current science park. Is doing the incubation program and also the uh, research uh, to be done over there because the location is very close to Shenzhen. So there's a certain measurement will be available to link up Hong Kong and Shenzhen in this area. And then uh, I'll talk about the funding, right? So um, from the startup size, I just mentioned about some incubation program available from the Hong Kong Science Technology Park and Cyber Port. Uh, for example, Incubus program, two years program, 860,000 Hong Kong dollar kind of a total funding available. Uh, in Tech, three years program, in Bao, four years program. And under the research and development side, we have different kind of scheme, right? So the enterprise support scheme, the partnership research program are all matching fund, one-to-one -one matching. The tax deduction for the R&D expenditure, cash rebate up to 40% of rebate of your R&D expenditure, and also talent research hub. Uh, what it means is like a um, salary subsidized, right? So for a company who are doing the R&D, they are enabled to hire up to four uh, R&D talent, which is in, can be a doctor degree or master degree, and then up to three years for, um, for the uh, subsidization. So each month they will, the government will subsidize the uh, certain amount of, of salary for those uh, research people to do the development. And then later on, on the adoption side, which is the commercialization side, government will provide different platform to enable the commercialization. Um, this is all about Hong Kong, right? So, we want to touch on a little bit about the Greater Bay Area. Um, the whole idea is the Greater Bay Area is a nine plus two city. Uh, it's talking about 70, 72 million population. Hong Kong is about 7 million. So you can imagine for the Greater Bay Area, we increase the population to 10 times. And also the GPA is representing 1.7 trillion, about 11% of China total uh, kind of a G GDP as a whole. So uh, the objective is to, to, to create, to stimulate the synergy of different city, uh, leveraging the um, international practice in Hong Kong, but the manufacturing power in those uh, cities in mainland China. The overall strategic intent is innovation, want to be the innovation hub, leveraging Hong Kong and also Shenzhen and also nearby cities to commerce, uh, worldwide manufacturing logistic powerhouse, international competitors, because Hong Kong is a very good on the international finance and trade center, livability, because Hong Kong, together with those cities in China, leveraging for the um, good uh, transport infrastructure. So from Hong Kong, you can travel within one hour to, to access to most of the city in, in mainland China already. So this is just a, a, some data about the GBA city. You can see in the ranking of uh, that 11th city, uh, representing 11 uh, total of China, of China GDP as a total. So if we compare the Greater Bay Area to other bays like San Francisco, New York Metropolitan, Tokyo Bay, the unique difference is that still a room to go because uh, you can see the uh, GDP per cap is still behind the other uh, Bay Area. But in terms of the, the potential, um, as you can see, the Hong Kong offering the financial center innovation and also the manufacturing base in um, the, those mainland city. So it becomes a more opportunity available in the Greater, Greater Bay Area compared to other existing Bay. Um, the Greater Bay Area, as you can see, nine major city, not just the nine major city, but also those uh, resources available in China will go, go to the Greater Bay Area, including the capital, including the worker, including the material or machinery, and will all go to Greater Bay Area, plus Hong Kong with the financial center, university resources, common law system we're using, simple tax, uh, professional service, um, including the lawyer, accountant available in Hong Kong, IP protection, or will become, will bring the synergy between the Greater Bay Area and Hong Kong and supported by the underlying three things, connectivity, which is the road uh, or, the, or the bridge available linking Hong Kong and, and or the GBA together, facilitation measure, some special measurement available between these two areas, like the tax uh, and also some travel convenience, technology enabled. So 5G blockchain, all those can allow that you can have a control center in Hong Kong to, mo to monitor the manufacturing in Greater Bay Area. So overall, you can have something in China for China, and also you can leverage the potential in Greater Bay Area for the Asian market as well. 
So um, just some example to play the role. So the diagrams on the left-hand side is different color represent the GDP per cap level, right? You can see Hong Kong is red, and then the nearby Shenzhen, Guangdong, Guangzhou is a more um, advanced um, kind of higher GDP area. So combining Hong Kong and Shenzhen can build an international R&D hub. Combining Hong Kong and Guangzhou, it can build a shared service center or management center. And combining Hong Kong and Zhuhai and Macau can become an entertainment center. Combining Hong Kong and other manufacturing center can become a logistic hub or a global, fund, a global uh, listing company hub uh, in Hong Kong. So the, Hong Kong and together different uh, city can play different roles in here. Just a very quick example, innovation. Um, we have seen one of the clients from UK, which is doing the robot uh, R&D in Hong Kong and leveraging, we'll be planning to leverage the manufacturing GBA. And because of the CEPA, some facilitation measure available. So for those robots can build in, in GBA or in Hong Kong, it can enter in China, targeting the empire addressable market in China. Commerce size. So we've seen one of the clients which is developing a, a platform which um, using the blockchain. So the, the prefabricated building module built in, in GBA area and then transport to, to Hong Kong, installed in Hong Kong. But you can make use of the blockchain to look after the whole uh, supply chain system and so on, the, um, as well as the international competitiveness. <clears throat> One of the innovation r and uh, the drug development in Hong Kong, and then they can produce the drug in China, in GBA, and then they can use the, uh, the Macau relationship with the EU in uh, uh, Portugal or Spain, and then through this, and then they can enter the drugs in, in the EU area. So there's a, a different kind of the uh, example that we can see is, is more and more happening between the GBA area. <clears throat> um, to summarize, by right, US Hong Kong, um, what we are doing, we help our client from the early stage of the planning stage to set up the business in Hong Kong. We're helping them to look for the business partner or uh, applying the visa, even if applying the visa or bank account. And then once they launch, we do the, po um, the promotion for the client. And then eventually we help the company to do the expansion. So um, just thank you so much for your time. It pretty up summarized what I'm trying to say and then I pass it back to Cecilia. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the, uh, uh, the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, for your uh, comprehensive, informative, and insightful presentation about Invest Hong Kong. Indeed, uh, Invest Hong Kong's role in facilitating companies to enter into China and Asia. Um, so, our next speaker is Ms. Irene Zhu. Irene is a partner of KPMG China in the audit practice and has up the new economy sector, as well as life sciences industries for the Hong Kong region. Irene is active in Hong Kong's startup community and connected with KPMG Global Enterprise Practice, which focuses on serving fast growing private businesses and entrepreneurs. Her team regularly collaborates with government agencies startup incubators, investors, universities, and corporates to support Hong Kong's innovation agenda and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Irene, at KPMG, um, you have been researching the development of innovation and entrepreneurship in Hong Kong. So in your view, in today's turbulent contexts. Uh, could you shed light on the resilience of the venture capital market in Asia? How does Hong Kong benefit from the regional expansion? And why is there an increasing trend of corporate startup collaboration? And lastly, are there any successful corporate venturing cases? Could you share your views with us, Irene. Yep. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, thank you, Cecilia, for the kind introduction. So, and I'm very glad to be with you and um, sharing some of the key findings from our study and also, um, uh, also just to also, I guess, is a good way to think about uh, what a turbulent year we had, but at the same time, um, 
how our entrepreneurs have demonstrated their resilience uh, in, in such a difficult time. So um, maybe to start off, if I could uh, um, give you a bit of a background of uh, the study that we've done with uh, Alibaba Entrepreneurs Fund in Hong Kong. So we started working with them uh, more than three years ago and to decide to examine more closely about the Hong Kong entrepreneurial landscape. Um, and so last year is our third year report uh, study. And uh, we have um, survey over uh, 800 students, uh, university students in Hong Kong, uh, also over 200 corporate executives, uh, as well as about 134 uh, entrepreneurs in Hong Kong. And we asked them various questions about um, their, uh, uh, their view about their business, about the outlook in the market. And, uh, and then we're trying to better understand kind of opportunity they see and also the, the, the challenges that they face. We also spoke with uh, um, key opinion leaders uh, from government and uh, from uh, uh, also uh, venture investment uh, field just to also get their, their input, what they think about the, the Hong Kong landscape. Uh, we've also looked at the venture capital investment trend uh, uh, over the past few years and see what, what it really tells us, right? Uh, are things getting better or there are gaps that we need to address? So um, the conclusion of that report is uh, about 22 recommendation came out of that study. Uh, addressing probably different stakeholders in Hong Kong about what more could be done to uh, continue to strengthen Hong Kong's uh, um, the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. But for today's purpose, I'll focus on some of the uh, uh, survey findings, uh, as well as a few case uh, or examples of uh, the sort of to fit the topic today is that what do we see in terms of the resilience in our market? So um, Andy has mentioned and gave you a pretty extensive and comprehensive overview about Hong Kong uh, ecosystem. And uh, I would just quickly go through this. I won't get into a lot of the detail, but basically Hong Kong is actually a very small market. And especially for those who are not from Hong Kong, right? With 7 million people, um, very densely uh, populated city, uh, but compared to mainland China, we're quite small. Uh, so however, so therefore it is important to look at um, sort of what is the Hong Kong sort of strategic position uh, when it comes to driving innovation, driving entrepreneurship. And within Hong Kong, there are, uh, a very interesting role that we play. So because on one hand, we have a big mainland market and Greater Bay Area being one, and Andy mentioned that, uh, but also the whole of mainland, right? This is just right behind us. And then we, in front of us, we got the international markets and Hong Kong always uh, wants to be the kind of a gateway for international market to come to China, but through Hong Kong. Uh, and also for Chinese company, that have ambitions to become global companies to venture out through Hong Kong. So within Hong Kong, uh, our strength uh, could be probably summarized in, in four areas. Number one, we got really strong government support and I don't think I need to spend more time on it because I think Andy has mentioned it with Science Park, CyberCorp and government funding. So we had a really committed uh, long-term and committed support from government on various uh, technology sectors. Secondly is the uh, access to talent. Um, we have really a uh, world-class university uh, and very much uh, focused and also very strong in basic research. And this is very unique of uh, Hong Kong might be already very famous for being a world, uh, international finance center. But at the same time, we have very strong university that uh, have over many decades, right? Focus on research uh, and also with technology that can be, uh, have been commercialized. So that strong R&D capability actually help us in terms of uh, uh, creating a pipeline of innovation 
um, that could be uh, commercialized on an ongoing basis. Uh, third uh, is the uh, being a, a strong capital markets, fundraising, and also whether it's through private fundraising or public fundraising through IPOs. Uh, Hong Kong is very famous for that. Uh, and then the, the last piece is about sort of this other ecosystem, whether it is private or public sectors, in terms of how they want to support startups as they grow and, uh, and, and uh, scale up. So that's just a, a, a quick context. In our study, I thought it'd be good to share that when we look at entrepreneurship, we look at two main areas, right? Um, how, how much the entrepreneurs are, how driven are they, right? Uh, when they start out the business. And then on the other hand, we look at the capabilities that we have. And when we talk about capabilities in the study, we cover not only entrepreneurs' own capability, but also the whole ecosystem, right? The support that we have. So the first finding I thought would be interesting to show is that uh, overwhelmingly majority of the startup that we survey, they have strong belief that they have a, a very uh, important role to, pl to play in the society uh, about developing new ideas that's about innovation, but also finding solution that can address uh, societal needs and also keeping that society dynamic and ready for future. See, these are very interesting finding that we, we thought over the past three years that that number keep increasing. And the more we see this, the more we believe that actually the Hong Kong entrepreneurs are really deeply caring about what's happening in the society and they wanna to contribute to that cause. Uh, secondly, is then, um, we look at, despite Hong Kong being a very small market, right? We have 7 million people. And many of these companies, when they start out, they recognize Hong Kong having a very small market. And therefore, they always start out thinking about, uh, we're not just uh, addressing Hong Kong's main issues and problems and uh, filling a gap, but also how can I be ready to go regional and go global, right? So I... I'm quoting three examples of companies that, and if you look at the, the, the fundraising records that they have achieved, and also the timing when they actually close these funding round, which is right uh, around the time when we were in the middle of a pandemic, uh, and also when some of the sector, for example, Kaylook, right, they're in travel uh, industry, a really uh, uh, challenging sector uh, over the past year. But despite that, they were able to raise big round of funding and to try and to sort of provide a new kind of experience and looking at what the future uh, uh, travelers are looking for. So they're sort of very forward looking despite all the challenges. Green Monday, Monday is another Hong Kong company uh, um, innovating the way how we consume our food and, and developing sort of plant-based uh, food uh, products to address not only health, but also climate issues. Uh, Orienti is a FinTech company also looking to provide credit, right? To those underserved community and businesses. So I talked about COVID being a challenging year. Uh, our entrepreneurs, when we, when we asked them, they all came back with very positive feedback in terms of uh, demand for the product and services actually are, um, are, have seen sort of gone up uh, significantly. And we put that number side by side with corporate. And you can see that a lot of the corporates uh, uh, were struggling and find it very challenging during the uh, pandemic. Uh, second statistic is that how likely, right, even during pandemic that they will start looking at new market and investing in new market you've got more entrepreneurs are thinking that they will be ready to do that more so than corporates, 49% versus 33%. And almost half of the entrepreneurs that we talked to, they are, they were collaborating with corporates in order to respond to the needs of the society, especially during COVID. Some of the examples that I, I wanna showcase, uh, show to, uh, share with you is, sort of three startups in Hong Kong, 
during COVID and how they have um, pivoted or uh, sort of scale up their, their facility and their service offering in order to address uh, the emergent needs of the society when it comes to COVID testing, right? How can we deliver these tests uh, to individuals safely? And uh, that's the pickup, that's a logistics startup. Prenetics is another uh, very interesting case whereby um, they used to be providing DNA testing services, but seeing that needs, they have the capability and then the facility. So they basically upgraded their, their service offering to uh, provide affordable COVID testing to the community. Hong Kong TV Mall is a Hong Kong listed company, long established, big corporate. Uh, however, they also see that local community, especially the SMEs are really struggling, the restaurants because of the social distancing measures. So they offered this app to help them, uh, charging very low commission to help them sort of deliver food to customers. So, so as you can see that uh, uh, how the startups are responding to, uh, to uh, the needs of the society. And when we asked corporate, right? And uh, what do they think of sort of working with startup uh, in terms of driving uh, their business needs, right? Uh, we also see fairly good response because over half and, uh, of the corporates uh, find that there's a lot of value working with a startup, whether it's to do with innovation, uh, speed up the market development, um, developing new revenue streams, uh, as well as having access to uh, more innovative uh, ideas and technologies, right, and forming partnerships. So, so, so there's the clear understanding and recognition of that benefit. And two examples here that especially, uh, uh, a, a, an example that covered very different sort of industry feel, new world development, a, um, uh, a property development group in Hong Kong uh, during COVID, uh, they create, created their, set up their own face mask production lines. And the, the reason they do that, it wasn't for commercial benefit or, or, or they're trying to make money, right? They're already uh, uh, a very big company. And why would they start looking at making masks is to help distribute them to those uh, uh, underprivileged families in Hong Kong. And they collaborate with NGOs and also a uh, different business partner to get those masks to those who are needed, the low income families and all that. CLP is another example. They're always a um, very uh, uh, forerunner and when it comes to driving innovation. And they, they work with uh, a technology startup and uh, uh, to sort of come up with new technology solution that can probably address some of these climate related issues and uh, renewable energy uh, needs. So, so they also uh, created their own CLP innovation hub uh, in Science Park and, and to pilot some of these new technologies. A quick overview about the uh, venture capital investment trends. Uh, in our study, we look at sort of the past seven years, right? How has that changed? And, uh, um, Financial year 1920, that was sort of right ended at the beginning of the pandemic. So therefore you see that the overall funding might be coming down slightly, but it's actually comparable to the year before. And uh, it, it shows that funding remained quite, uh, quite strong despite uh, the, uh, the challenges. And then that split, uh, it, uh, the red color represent the funding coming from the private venture investors. The blue one and then the purple together is from governments, uh, including the incubation program as well as venture capital investments. So the, the characteristic that uh, is about unique about Hong Kong is that government does uh, um, uh, contribute quite significantly to the overall funding to a startup in Hong Kong. At the same time, uh, we can see that the startup in Hong Kong are maturing over the years. The reason we say that is that you can see that the latest HBC investment now represent a pretty good sizable portion of the overall venture capital investment. Meaning that, and these venture uh, 
in, uh, venture companies are ready to attract bigger round funding. The, the, um, the median, uh, median deal size also tell us that that number is growing, which is a very uh, good sort of uh, indication that these companies are getting more, uh, have the opportunity to scale up and, and, and become uh, bigger and uh, become stronger. Uh, in terms of uh, sectors, it's quite diverse, uh, but nonetheless, they do align with some of the strategic st sectors that the Hong Kong government has been promoting, right? In AI, FinTech, Smart City, um, and software, e-commerce, biotech is, uh, uh, might be a small portion here, but uh, if we look at the bigger picture, including the public market fundraising, biotech actually uh, contributed quite significantly. So when we talk about venture capital investment, Hong Kong is still relatively small, but nonetheless received really healthy performance over the past seven years. You can't quite ignore the fact that China is the major VC um, ecosystem and the investments. And I thought I would show you sort of uh, uh, some of the top deals that in the last quarter of 2020. And they are, uh, um, both the top 10 deals in Asia, a lot of, a lot, most of them are actually from China and they cover anywhere from truck hailing, on-demand logistic companies to ad tech and e-commerce and electric vehicles. So it just gives you that overview that, that the, the activity in China also uh, is very interesting at the same time that how it can attract the right company to come to Hong Kong because there's just so much going on in China. So I think that that sort of neighboring effect is, is quite relevant as well. A quick one, because I know Andy talked about the IPO, so I won't go into the detail. If you can focus on just the right-hand side, that slide, right? Uh, Hong Kong exchange uh, uh, for the last past few years have been uh, promoting a lot about bringing new economy uh, innovative company to the Hong Kong uh, capital markets. And uh, just in 2020, last year, uh, more than half of the fund raised from IPO are from the innov innovative company, and we call that new economy companies. So you can see that the important to highlight the IPO market is the fact that a strong capital markets, especially for innovative companies, help feed the, the demand and the uh, funding uh, activity in the private market. So my last slide, uh, just three key takeaways in terms of what we think is important when we think about the, the resilience of the Hong Kong uh, entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem is that despite Hong Kong being very small, the, um, the founders here have a very strong sense of purpose that trying to address needs of the society. Uh, they also very adaptable, very agile. Uh, whether it's challenging time or being a small market, they think about how can we uh, adapt and also have the opportunity to scale. So that entrepreneurial mindset is pretty uh, strong. And third is that we do have a very supportive ecosystem, uh, whether it's about funding, government, uh, policy support, and that geographical uh, location that gives us an advantage to reach global talents, but also very big market in China. So uh, that sums up sort of my key takeaway. If any of you are interested in that report, um, I included the QR code and feel free to um, uh, have a read and um, do reach out if you have any comments and suggestions. I also included my, um, my contact information here. So I wanna just give the floor back to uh, Cecilia. Thank you very much, Irene, uh, for highlighting the strategic role of Hong Kong as the gateway linking China and global markets. We are pleased that the Hong Kong startups are capable of attracting investors. They are collaborating with uh, corporations and the venture capital market is maturing and most important of all, it is healthy. Now at this point, I would like to invite our third speaker Mr. Tony Tung to come forward. Mr. Tony Tung is Managing Director of Gobi Partners, China. 
Tony has accumulated extensive experience in growing high-tech businesses from his two previous startups related to fintech and enterprise solutions in big data. As for Gobi Partners China, it is the exclusive general partner of the Alibaba Hong Kong Entrepreneurs Fund. The company has established itself as the most active and influential VC investor in Hong Kong. Gobi Partners portfolio consists of almost 50 startups covering a wide range of sectors in artificial intelligence, fintech, consumer, healthcare, logistics, sustainability, and so on. The company has helped to nurture three unicorns in Hong Kong. They are Air Wallace, WeLab, and GoGoX, as well as numerous companies. Gobi is indeed an active contributor to our ecosystem. Now, Mr. Cheng, with Gobi Partners leading position, would you share the overall trend of investing in tech startups in Hong Kong and in particular in the Greater Bay Area, China? And which industries attract the most venture capital in the Greater Bay Area? And how overseas companies could capture opportunities in the Greater Bay Area, China, so as to expand into Asia? We are very interested in hearing your views, Mr. Tung. Hey, hey guys. Um, thank you, Cecilia, for inviting me to be a proud speaker today. And I'm glad to represent Gobi Partners to talk to you about like the overall, like what Gobi does and also the our particular like uh, point of view about the Hong Kong VC markets, uh, the Greater Bay Area investment opportunities, and also share a little bit of our experience in, um, in talking about like how we are helping a uh, company all around the world to enter the China market, especially also um, how we help our Chinese uh, portfolio company to go around the world. So I'll give you, uh, to start off this, so I'll give you a little background of Gobi. So we are a Pan-Asia VC, so we started off in 2002 here in Shanghai. So Shanghai is our original headquarter. So over the past uh, 18 years, so we have been growing into, into in, a, in a global uh, venture capital firm. So we have, right now we have offices, not only in Shanghai, but Beijing, Hong Kong as uh, China practices. And also we, have, we also have a six uh, offices here in Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh City, Jakarta, and Manila. And also we have already set up uh, our Middle East practices um, um, a few years ago. So we have our uh, office in Saudi Arabia, in UAE, and also in particular in Pakistan. So with all these uh, 13 uh, locations, um, we have, we are right, right now, we are managing about like a little bit over 1 billion, Euro, 1 billion US dollar uh, uh, AUM right now, and we have already invested in over 270 uh, startups globally. And in particular, in our Hong Kong office, so we are the exclusive uh, general partner or the investment manager of the Alibaba Hong Kong Entrepreneurs Fund. So here is a little bit of snap snapshot of uh, some of the portfolios here in Hong Kong. So you see some of our unicorn, for example, Google X, LLS, VLab. And also, we also have a lot of different uh, uh, startups uh, around the world, not only in Hong Kong, but particularly, I want to highlight that. So you see, you see there is a, a company called AutoX. So AutoX is basically the Thomas driving companies uh, originate from the, unit, from the Silicon Valley. But the founders are, are, all, are all Chinese uh, people. So with our investment, we help other companies to land in Hong Kong and expand to uh, the Chinese market. So there's kind of like helping them to transit from a Silicon Valley company in a Chinese company. And also another example I want to highlight is that uh, is that Affinix. So Affinix is a semiconductor company that specializes in a very niche uh, subset of chips. It's called FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. So it's kind of a chip that you can customize their, their, their circuit, the circuitry, a point deployment. So there are a lot of different use cases. 
And right now, the, the global uh, FPGAs markets uh, are mainly dominated by uh, dominated by Intel's and also dominated by our, uh, another company called Science. So there, there are a bunch of our Chinese people. They're, they're setting up the company in Silicon Valley and they, they wanna like try to tap into the China market. So we also revive investment. We happen to land in Hong Kong. And we have to set up offices in, in, in Sanjiang, in Guangzhou, in, in, in Hangzhou, in China, so that they can help to like uh, really to capture the Chinese market and also to um, enjoy the dividends here in, in particular in the China market and also the, the US market uh, in parallel. So talking about the, um, the Greater Bay Area uh, opportunity is that I think uh, Andy has already like talked a lot of, about, about the Greater Bay Area and I won't uh, talk into details, but I would like to particularly highlight that with uh, these uh, different type different type of cities here in the Greater Bay Area, actually, uh, uh, for example, in Dongguan and in Fosan, in Guangzhou, they are very like very heavily uh, in manufacturing. So from historical reasons, they have been uh, a manufacturing powerhouse uh, of China and also they're, they're supplying almost like uh, over 50% of the global electronic devices here in these few cities. So we, so from our perspective, we see that there are a lot of, uh, of manufacturing capabilities. They have a lot of, uh, of technological capabilities in creating their own uh, digital uh, electronics uh, or even industrial products here in the region. So that uh, with, with the uh, transitions of the, of the, of the entire uh, Chinese economy and also the promotions of uh, greater area. So that's actually a lot of her uh, talents, a lot of her, a lot of her uh, uh, ex uh, factory, factory owners. They want to create their own brand. They want to create, step aside to, to, to step up from along the supply chain to create their, their own businesses instead of uh, only being a factory or we call OEM to certain brands in China or to certain brands uh, in the in other part of the, of, the, of, the, of the region, for example, Apple. So as you know that uh, uh, almost all the iPhones is actually manufacturing here in Shenzhen and Dongguan. So, so to sum up it particularly that uh, Greater Bay Area is a very like, uh, have a very strong capability in manufacturing. And we saw uh, so that we see that in particular in Industry 4.0 or, 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 or other, or other this type of a, of a semiconductor, a deep tech is a very like, very large categories a very like huge investment trend for us here in the Great Bay Area. Another another point I want to highlight is that, um, in particular, I think I think I think GBA would be a very strategic locations or have a very strategic uh, place here in the Chinese uh, economic growth because of the one by one row uh, initiative uh, proposed by the central government. So uh, here the uh, Great Bay Area would be the the door between China and also the, the rest of the, of the, of the Bay and Road regions are countries. So for these regions, it comprises of over 60% of global populations, 30% of the global GDP, and also 35% of the road trade. So in particular, there will be, we will see a lot of uh, growth opportunities uh, of trading, international trading, e-commerce, uh, capital flow, and that's why we also see that a lot of different, like for example, consumer uh, related industry, also FinTech, they are also very like uh, promising here in the regions in terms of our investment opportunities. And here is a little bit of a statistics I want to show you guys. So here on the left of the, of the chart, you can see that actually uh, China is almost the same as the, the US. If we are talking about the number of unicorn here in, in globally. And in particular in China, you can see that, that uh, apart from Beijing and Shanghai, so Greater Bay Area also uh, contribute a significant uh, number of technology unicorns uh, as of 2020. And on the right hand side, you can see that the detail uh, uh, growth and breakdown of this kind of unicorn. So you can see that actually the number of unicorn here in the Greater Bay Area is actually like growing, growing very fast uh, compared with the Beijing one and also from, compared with Shanghai one. For Beijing and Shanghai, they are a little bit less than 20% uh, growth per annum, but you, but you can see that for the Greater Bay Area, they're actually like, uh, they're growing uh, over 45% uh, annually. So we see that um, 
So China is a huge market. It's a very large homo homogeneous market, sing single, pop single, sing 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 single population, single culture. And we can see a lot of happening, business model happening in China. But in particular, we see that um, Greater Bay Area is actually like the next uh, powerhouse and also the, the, the next uh, best source of growth here in the China market in terms of the uh, number of unicorns and also in terms of the, uh, the, the contribution of GDP uh, to the overall China economy. So we see that uh, from statistics, from data, we see that uh, Greater Bay Area is also is a very uh, interesting part for us as a VC to, take, to look into and develop our footprint here. And to sum up, uh, there is actually, actually we have uh, have a make a very little conclusions about showing about like six uh, main vertical here in Greater Bay Area that we think uh, is a very interesting to to look into. The first one is uh, artificial intelligence, as you all know. Uh, Sense time is also coming from Hong Kong, and this is a very huge uh, um, artificial intelligence computer vision company here in China. And we also see that actually a lot of our uh, different um, talents coming from this kind of a, a top-notch uh, AI companies and coming out to set up their own companies to, to using AI to tackle, tackle different uh, problems uh, in different use cases, different industry. So, so AI is definitely one of the key uh, setters here in greater area. And secondly, as I, as I just mentioned, uh, Industry 4.0, Deep Tech is also another, another one very interesting part. And consumers about, you know, about the, the, the overall Greater Bay Area, we see that um, a lot of growth and, a lot of, and, and, a, and high proportions of the populations here in Greater Bay Area is actually uh, the, the Gen Y, Gen Z uh, populations. And there are a lot of new customer behavior, a lot of new uh, uh, user preferences that are happening here in the market. We, all, we also see a lot of different consumer opportunities going forward. And particularly, I want to highlight as uh, Hong Kong as a part of the uh, leader, leading cities in uh, Greater Bay Area. So, so Hong Kong has a very strategic position as an international financial center. And a lot of our different uh, financial services uh, is very special and it's is only happening here in Hong Kong in order to facilitate the trades, uh, the businesses uh, between China and the rest of the world. So a lot of uh, FinTech model that might not be available or might not work here in the mainland China, but actually they can, they can work uh, in Hong Kong and also in the Greater Bay Area. With the uh, ultimate support of the central government, uh, the Chinese government about the overall policy of the regulations about the FinTech area. So we see that a lot of innovations come in here. And, so, and that's why we also conclude that FinTech is also the next uh, a key set as we see in, in, in the region. And healthcare, as we all know, so with the COVID-19, uh, we see a lot of different uh, healthcare companies, stocks coming up many different healthcare startups that actually raise a lot of funds here globally. But actually in particular, I want to highlight that actually uh, within the China market, uh, a lot of our uh, uh, tertiary education, uh, key hospitals, actually in the regions. And they, they provide a lot of uh, medical talents, healthcare talents, and they, they're, they are also a lot of different like, facilities, a lot of capitals, a lot of people is actually are doing a significant uh, contributions and significant research in the academia or within the healthcare centers. So there, there will be a lot of uh, new companies, uh, new teams coming up uh, with, with, with a proposal, for example, a new drugs, for example, a new type of uh, a drug discovery, drug development, or a or, or, or different type of medical device. Uh, we also, that's, that's why we also see uh, healthcare is a as a, another, another big area for us to look into, into the greater area. And finally, sustainability. So I'm not sure if you guys know that actually uh, the, 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 the greater area in the past few decades has, has, always, been the, the, has always been the hub of uh, recycling, uh, materials, uh, all that kind of stuff. And we see that actually this kind of uh, uh, history would enable the entrepreneurs here in the regions to develop more sustainable uh, economy by by doing something in, for example, in circular economy, in new materials, and with uh, uh, some kind of a uh, different kind of business model in this area. And that's why this is how we um, conclude the, the the trends of investing in the technology startup here in the Greater Bay Area. So AI, Industry 4.0, consumer, fintech, healthcare, and sustainability. 
So I think, uh, hope this will give you guys a little bit of a background of what we do here in Hong Kong in Greater Bay Area and also give you a little bit uh, highlights on what is uh, going to anticipate in, in, in terms of investing in the Greater Bay Area. So um, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for showing us the maturity of startups in China and the changing business landscapes in the Greater Bay Area. Uh, for those interested in developing their business in the Greater Bay Area, do pay attention on six key areas. They are artificial intelligence, industry 4.0, uh, consumer goods, fintech, healthcare, and sustainability. So the GBA is the hub linking China with the one bell, one row countries. And most of all, the GBA is becoming the next major startup in China. Uh, at this point, may I invite Mr. T Timothy Chui to come forward? Um, Mr. Timothy Chui is the private investor and the former CEO of Fence Wi-Fi. Timothy has over 14 years of banking and investment experiences at Goldman Sachs, UBS Wealth Management, and the investment department of China Life Insurance Overseas Limited. Now, Timothy, we would appreciate it if you would share your personal experience and the case of Fence Wi-Fi with us. I would like to pose a few questions. Uh, what roles do investors or corporations play in boosting growth of your business? What advice would you give to startups to ensure a successful collaboration with large corporations? And how can overseas startups prepare themselves so as to leverage on the opportunities in the region? We look forward to hearing from you, Timothy. Thank you, Cecilia, for having me um, and for Innovation Forum to have me as well. Um, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so I come from a banking background, as uh, Cecilia has mentioned, and um, uh, I spent a good three, four years um, working inside a uh, software startup. That was a B2B startup. So what we provided, a company's called Fans Wi-Fi. So I invested in that company as well as uh, became the CEO for a number of years for the company, helping with business development, fundraising, finance, um, and uh, developing sales channels. And so what that company did, uh, we provided Wi-Fi enabled software that allows um, uh, the companies and our customers to collect social media data. So football data, um, social media follows and likes, and that was very beneficial to a lot of our key clients, which included LVMH Group, um, uh, Wing Lung Bank, which is a bank based in Hong Kong. Uh, we also work with Topshop and many major multinationals. Um, we, uh, during my tenure there, also worked very closely with uh, PCCW HKT, which is the largest telecoms provider here in Hong Kong. Um, and so we started off when I first joined, we only had 30 customers. Um, but then uh, by the time I left, we had um, about 400 customers in seven different countries. And so um, that, that ramp up, uh, as well as that growth was, uh, was quite phenomenal. And uh, we worked with all kinds of uh, SMEs, uh, small shops that only have, you know, one or two, three uh, retail outlets all the way to large telcos. Um, H PCW HKT was a key sales channel for us, uh, allowing us to reach hundreds of uh, new customers um, by collaborating with them. So we spent a lot of time integrating our software um, into their uh, uh, offering of software and uh, helping them repackage it so that they can uh, better sell their broadband services. So it would be an, uh, the software would be an add-on uh, software to their uh, existing uh, monthly subscription broadband services, especially for um, uh, corporate clients. So that was a very, very uh, uh, interesting uh, experience and time. 
and also expanding and working with corporates um, in channel provide uh, channels sales channels in Southeast Asia. So we expanded to Taiwan, we expanded to um, South Africa, uh, Singapore, um, Indonesia. So we and now we have clients in Cambodia as well, and, and in Australia. So that was quite a journey. Uh, I learned a lot uh, during that that process. How to work with um, partners of different cultures, different languages, um, and really, you know, get my hands and feet dirty um, doing the sales, business development, and, and really trying to uh, promote the product. I'm still working very closely with the company now, advising on uh, strategic investors, um, and also we are now um, currently developing new product also aimed at doing uh, data anal analytics for uh, retail um, uh, companies and also f and companies um, it, because it is software it can be uh, deployed anywhere in the world it's cloud-based so uh, uh, we are working very uh, closely um, and, and very uh, diligently on developing this new product which i'm excited to hopefully see in about uh, nine to twelve months time uh, and then to, to uh, at the end of the year. So yeah, so that's uh, what uh, I've been doing at Fans Wi-Fi. And I think um, it's, it's very exciting that uh, startups now, whether they be based in Hong Kong, Europe, or anywhere in the world, are able to develop new products and services um, that can so, uh, solve societal needs, uh, or even some of the needs of, of businesses and large corporates. Uh, so right now, by being in Hong Kong, um, I'm uh, incubating right now a new fintech uh, startup. And so working closely with our CTO, who's a PhD in mathematics uh, from UC Berkeley. And so we are developing um, an, what we call a security token uh, type of product, an asset-backed token offering uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, right, obviously, we're going to be working very hard right now to build the infrastructure build the systems, uh, design uh, the, the front end and the back end uh, uh, architecture and, and systems, as well as getting the necessary licenses and uh, to be a approved and regulated uh, uh, provider here in Hong Kong uh, as security um, and security tokens are a regulated industry um, here in Hong Kong. We see um, uh, FinTech is, is, is going to be huge. Um, uh, the development over the next uh, three to five years uh, in Hong Kong is, is going to grow rapidly, as as Antonio mentioned um, uh, previously. Uh, I think, you know, COVID is, is a very interesting time. It has really changed um, a lot of uh, multinationals and, and corporates and, and also consumer taste and consumer behavior. Uh, we're no longer traveling like we used to. Um, we now are having uh, a lot of uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, webinars. Um, we are seeing people paying more with cashless options, uh, mobile payments. Um, we're also seeing the rise of uh, popularity in Bitcoin um, and cryptocurrency demand, especially at the institutional level um, in the past uh, only few months. And, and, and Tesla and, and large corporates looking into this area in, in a large way allocating capital uh, and institutional investors also um, uh, allocating capital in, in this area. So uh, for myself, you know, coming from uh, a finance and banking background, I think, and also having worked at a tech company, um, uh, early stage startup uh, for a number of years and also investing uh, in early stage companies over the past five, six years, I think uh, I'm in a good position um, to uh, build something, uh, build a company, uh, build products and services that can help uh, large corporates, uh, investors um, as a whole, um, what we call professional investors here in Hong Kong, as well as institutional investors. I think uh, financial markets uh, really need a lot of innovation, uh, uh, especially we have been, you know, doing and using products and services um, like funds and equities and bonds, you know, similar things for the past 50, 60 years. Um, we need more innovation in this area, especially more selection and choice when it comes to um, uh, things to invest in, uh, things that can provide 
uh, uh, regular um, income or a dividend uh, is very much needed in such a low interest rate environment globally. So I think you know there's there's a lot we can do um, in the coming years. I'm very excited. Um, uh, I love to invest uh, in early stage companies. So if you have great ideas um, and a good team. I'm happy to take a look, um, as well as um, give advice and open doors, whatever uh, I can do to help. I'm very uh, collaborative with some of the uh, uh, founders um, and uh, investing companies that I have worked with. Um, they do value a lot of uh, my input as well. So yeah, happy to uh, uh, share more um, and, and throughout this panel um, and this webinar uh, of my experience as well. Thank you, thank you, Timothy, for sharing your insider experience as the CEO of Fence Wi-Fi. Your experiences in sourcing funds and establishing uh, corporate collaborations in building markets in different countries should serve as a good reference for overseas startups who are planning to come to Hong Kong, China, and Asia. Now, at this point, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Iwan Robes. He will work with Professor Shai Weikalam to host the second part of the webinar. We're going to have a panel discussion on startup corporate collaboration. Iwan, please. Dr. Robes, please. Hi there. Uh, yes. Uh... No, thank you very much, Cecilia. Um, and yeah, very interesting talks, really sort of covering the, the great opportunities in the uh, Hong Kong Bay Area. So it's very interesting and very interesting for Innovation Forum to connect with that. Um, so uh, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Professor Jai Weikel, um, who is the Visiting Professor of Entrepreneurship at Cranfield University in the UK. Uh, who will be talking with Professor Dr. T uh, Tobias Gutman and uh, Miss Irene Graham will be, um, and they will be discussing the um, startup corporate collaborations and also the trends of investing in tech startups. Can you hear me all right? Yes. <clears throat> Super. I'm hoping. Um, so the plan, uh, uh, I'm just going to say good day, everybody, or good evening, everybody. So somewhere along the way, the clock is ticking. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, very much for this invitation, and also uh, Ivan for the uh, for sharing this. Basically, there are three of us. Uh, each of us would like to say a few words and then open up for for discussion Q and A. So that's the that's the plan. And I was thinking um, the best way to do is to, thinking about this idea of trends, uh, Cecilia. It's very interesting listening to this topic from your previous speaker. Do we have fashions, right? And fashions last perhaps a um, a season or so. <laughs> I started by saying fundamentally that uh, the topic of trends is really interesting because we do go through some fashions as well in entrepreneurship. You know, some things are really cool, some things are not. A trend, I feel, is something that's longer term. So, um, th so that's one of the things in the. I'm not sure whether unicorns are trends or, or fashions or whether AI is a trend or a fashion. I'm, I'm sure time will, time will tell us in due course. Um, what I wanted to say was that before we hear from uh, first Irene and then from Tobias to give us their views on, on, on this topic is that uh, my, my colleague Uday and I have done some, some work on this area of startup and scale up. And um, what we found from our data of over 300 companies was that companies go through, broadly speaking, three significant inflection points. The first one is just, especially in the tech sector, just understanding uh, the product market fit, if you like, and proving that the technology actually works for the, in the customer's hands. The second uh, inflection point is a significant one for growing companies, especially those that are tech driven, which is to establish themselves as actually a business. So going beyond the project into becoming a business. The third uh, inflection point, we call these three chasms, the triple chasm model. The third one is when they've understood their business, they've understood their product market fit, they've understood their customers and the marketplaces overall, 
and are now resourced to scale significantly. In this understanding of ours, we've also got this idea of how long will it take to get there and, and looking at the speed of markets and how quickly we can grow in that. We've come up with the concept of T-max. And our finding is that uh, if, if you take eight to 10 years or 10 to 12 years as kind of the roughly the, the, the time it takes to reach your maximum potential of what we call C-max, total number of customers that you can access, we find that we've only ever hit about 10% of that customer base about halfway through our journey. That finding was like a, 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 a huge insight for us because it told us a number of different things. First and foremost, that we might be misaligned with venture capitalists, investors' expectations of the sort of exit after five to seven years. We might be misaligning with uh, expectations of the so-called unicorns. And our first book, which dealt with this topic, actually was called Camels, Tigers, and Unicorns. Uh, that book is not for the faint-hearted. Uh, the scale-up manual is a more accessible document. But as a result of that, we think that we need to work with uh, investors, uh, intervention agencies of various kinds, to understand the impact that this insight has for how we scale up. So Irene will be speaking in a few minutes, but I want to also say that we need to understand whether we're scaling up at the very, very early stages when we're just reaching the first chasm, because the, the, the challenges of even reaching that first point are enormous, uh, especially when scientists and entrepreneurs are getting together like oil and water and trying to make uh, something beautiful out of it. The second stage, once they've crossed that chasm, is the real scale up beginning with building teams, building sales, building volumes, and all the different challenges that arise there and the types of funding that align with all of that. And the third and the overseas uh, chasm, the globalization chasm, is when we are maybe looking for the greater Bay Area, looking for something else. But what is it that we can do to connect up with the Deutsch get joined up along the entire uh, innovation journey? The corporates have a role to play in scaling up. They say maybe to startups, if they come to them, ah, you're a bit too early for us, we can't quite camp. And then various other conversations take place. At what point do the tech startups connect with the rest of the ecosystem? What does the rest of the ecosystem have to play? What role does it have to play in understanding how to cross these various chasms? So I'm absolutely fascinated also by the KPMG report because in my own understanding of the way I see trends happening, especially amongst the younger generation, uh, but also more widely, is the need to be meaningful and purposeful, increasingly so. And it's wonderful to see social impact funding taking off, which also aligns actually with a greater variety of types of funding. Not only is it the old private equity, you know, um, the smart suited slick venture capitalist from Silicon Valley coming along in his Tesla or her Tesla, but now we have all sorts of farmers and old money, new money mixing up and saying, actually, we need to make something happen. And people wanting to find purpose, crowdfunding, business angel investor led funding. I think I see, I work a lot in Europe and I see also a lot of different types of funding across there taking place. And that again aligns with the KPMG finding. There's a lot of government initiated venture capital funds in that area as well as the. Um, uh, halfway houses that Germany is so famous for with the Fraunhofer's, etc. So there is a much greater uh, need for entrepreneurs to understand the ecosystem and indeed for the ecosystem to understand the entrepreneur. So there's a, a, a lot to discuss. Um, and the other trend that I'm finding, I hope it's a trend and not a, not a fashion, is that more people in midlife are taking to entrepreneurship than ever before. Uh, it may be because they're fed up with, uh, with the life in uh, large organizations, I have to be careful how I say this because Tobias is to follow me. Um, or they might be finding that they're being pushed by corporates to go find a new career somewhere else because of COVID-19. I saw this also in the 1980s, soon after Mrs. Thatcher came to power when uh, privatization was the, was the essence and coal industries, steel industries and so on were all uh, being changed radically the point where people in middle management were having to go find new, new careers for themselves. There was a lot of startup activity then. Now I think globally, because of the need to search for meaning and purpose and for other economic and social and political reasons, people in midlife are also getting into this environment. That's an area we don't fully uh, understand yet how to help them. We've got the kind of classic model of university graduate venture capital, 
um, you know, consulting in, in environment, et cetera, et cetera, raise money, make a unicorn and go start another company. Midlifers have a different set of causes behind them and we need to get our heads around that. But I would like to now uh, uh, hand back to, to you, uh, I want to introduce uh, Irene. Uh, and Irene, it's really nice to see you again because we met a few years ago and so I'm so pleased to see the Scale Up Institute flourishing the way it is. And of course, we're also connected through Cranfield because you've been a great support of the business growth program there. So thank you very much. I don't know whether that's enough, Ivan, as an introduction, or you have something more you'd like to do. No, no, please go ahead. Can, okay. I won't break your flow. <laughs> Thanks so, so Irene, much, everybody. And, and the nice. on topic. Over to you, Irene. Thank you so much, everyone, and delighted to be with you all um, this morning. Um, the Scale Up Institute is, as it says on the tin, focused on how we uh, actually drive the scale up opportunities in the UK and we work very closely with our own innovation agency Innovate UK who a number of you will know. I'm delighted to also be um, here with you virtually in Hong Kong. Uh, my career has spanned um, the globe and I started in Standard Chartered Bank so I spend a lot of time in Hong Kong in Asia and then across Europe and the Americas so I'm just um, delighted to be back hearing about all the great stuff that's happening in Hong Kong I know that Bay Area well I know the um, country well and the great connectivity to China so um, uh, delighted to hear all of the initiatives taking place and to see you all today. Um, one of the things that, that we uh, look at when we uh, look at the scale up agenda is and why it's important is that many countries now have been quite good at startups um, lots of different policies and initiatives happening in the startup space and you've talked a lot there in uh, Hong Kong today on that but um, we're not doing well when we look at it from a scale up perspective um, we did some analysis uh, recently just on the European landscape on scaling up and you can see the way in which that uh, dynamic occurs overall if we switch to the next slide please Richard um, one shows that the um, you know in, in in the period that we looked at um, we had around 2.4 million starting up businesses in 2011 however only 42% of those survived by 2016, and only 0.17% actually reached a scale-up stage, meaning that they were at 20% growth in turnover employment, and I had at least 10 employees. Um, and yet, as we um, know, and as um, Reid Hoffman would say, competitor advantage doesn't actually uh, come to the company that first starts, but it's really to the company that scales. And it's why we put such an emphasis on this being an important aspect of our UK and indeed the global economy. Um, you've all talked about the ecosystem. And one of the things that is very clear when one is driving forward in relation to a country seeking to also be very good at scale up it needs to work with the ecosystem. And that ecosystem is made up of all the different players we've heard about today, from the entrepreneurs, to the investors, to the government, to the educators, and very importantly, what we're focusing on in this session on the corporate side of that. Um, I do want to emphasize why scale up matters. Um, uh, Irene herself in her presentation talked a lot about the, the various characteristics that we see in businesses scaling, but they are incredibly innovative when compared to the broader SME population. They're very productive. They are hiring in people. And we've seen that exactly in the UK across this COVID period the drive for innovation, the drive also to global markets um, and, and moving into other marketplaces and great connectivity into Asia, et cetera. And they're still planning for growth um, in this coming year. So that's why we think scale-ups are so important. And it's also important to reflect on what the drivers of local um, scale-up growth are. And certainly in our analysis, um, I know we've heard the word of startups quite a lot here today, but startup density and, and numbers of startups and survivals won't always lead to scaling up. Um, what we found were three key um, elements and ingredients of what really made the difference. It wasn't the number of, um, as I say, startups. It wasn't whether transport was good. It wasn't whether there was debt. But it was three things related to the skilled talent 
um, the clusters and hub effect and the ability to access growth capital. All of three things you've talked about in various ways this morning. And I think that's really important as you move forward in taking your, um, in the corporate world, in the public sector world, in growing that scale up community in Hong Kong. Alongside that active university engagement, the local collaboration, and the knowledge uh, sharing. So what are scale ups and, and, and our scaling businesses who are on that journey value and want most? Well, they want really good access to marketplaces, that corporate collaboration, that ability to collaborate with government and that ability to go overseas. And they very much want as well support on the innovation and R&D agenda. And that's why we're seeking to address that very closely with our innovation agencies um, today in the UK. So let's delve a little bit further into that corporate and government collaboration element. Um, here in the UK, um, while scale-ups and scaling businesses currently do sell into government, they do sell into large corporates, they seek to collaborate with corporates, universities and government, there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go in how that can be achieved to better effect. And so some of the things we are doing in the Scale Up Institute is looking at, well, what makes collaboration procurement better? What are the key ingredients? Who can we learn from in terms of that uh, approach? So as part of our overall journey and activity that we've undertaken in the last number of years, it's been really trying to look at what are the barriers to the, co the collaboration that takes place. And many of you working in this space will know there's a range of barriers that block that collaborative um, environment. It's cultural. Um, there's a difference in the way in which a corporate and a scaling business leader and entrepreneur think and work. Um, systems are different, structural elements are different, procedures are different. And there's a question as to whether at the corporate end, there is that strategic element of focus on this. It's important and encouraging that we're seeing more corporates engaged in this environment now, but there's more to be done because processes are complex. Getting to know what opportunities to bid for are not easy to find and navigating that is, is ever, uh, ever complex and difficult. So what do we see when we look at those players that do this well? And one of the things we've sought to do is analyze what is actually good practice, what is working well. And we've got a range of, of activities that we see operating in the UK and internationally that seek to drive this overall corporate collaboration and collaboration in the ecosystem better and some of those are highlighted there in this space whether it's engine sheds the SCA um, sandbox whether it's Barclays with their Eagle Labs Nat West with their accelerator level 39 which is fintech and focused on that collaboration or the digital catapult in the broader environment and then Brabraham and Audley Park very focused on um, that collaboration on the life sciences side we've also in the last number of years undertaken work with Nestor and Mind and Bridge to look at really good corporate stars. Who's got the best uh, startup accelerators that are also enabling scaling up to take place? Who's got um, very good open innovation activity? Who has good entrepreneurship um, activity taking place? And, and looking at how they also provide that uh, venture support to, to businesses. Um, and when we've looked at that uh, in further detail, just a, a few of them that I'll highlight in terms of um, MasterCard, Telefonica, Vodafone um, and Samsung Electronics, who've worked with a number of scaling businesses in terms of what we saw as some of the features within their, their structure. What you found in uh, all of these in various ways is a really strong strategic focus on working with startup and scale up businesses. And that's really important. If you're going to cut through the structural issues that large global corporates have, you have to have that strategic engagement. 
And then there's been a focus on providing collaborative projects and opportunities, which not just link into the particular company itself, whether it be MasterCard or Telefonica or Vodafone, but also into the actual end consumer user. So how do you actually work with a startup to scale up to um, absolutely embed their opportunities and services into your own clients? base and open doors for them into those clients as well as looking at pushing what products and services you provide we've seen in a couple of them the way they've actually taken on board fast track procurement processes something that vodafone does very well we've also seen how they may actually put investment in having worked with the company mastercard being exams an example samsung electronics also but doing that in a way that still allows the company to be independent that's scaling and that's very important as they go through that journey and opportunity when we've then brought that into some overall learnings, we've also seen the opportunities that supply chain initiatives can take place. So sharing and growth is a manufacturing initiative focused on supporting those in the supply chain of our aerospace industry and how that has wraparound support in developing the talent and leadership within um, the companies that are scaling. So we've got what we call the 10 key do's for collaborating with scale-ups and scaling businesses. Um, and those go across the Open Innovation Unit, having that direct line of sight uh, with your chief executive officers, CIOs, chief digital officers within the corporate. What we've heard a lot about today, what's that accelerator or hub that you're building as a corporate to work with these uh, businesses, which can include co-working space, shared resources, and the opportunity to collaborate on very, very specific projects. Um, fast track procurement, really important to get through those compliance and legal issues and building that open innovation approach. We've seen what the power of hubs can do, and I've touched on some of them before, but also how they coordinate the ecosystem around them. And there's been uh, a touching on some of those initiatives in Hong Kong, which show and display that linkage to the universities, the business schools, the opportunity to link to investors, to mentors, to peer to peer, and how you're using data to, to enable that connectivity. When we look at procurement, there's certainly some simple steps that can be taken to actually enable corporates to buy better and more quickly from our scaling and startup firms. And again, um, I think there's been some examples of that in, in the discussion today about that scouting for talent and making sure it's a long-term engaged opportunity. And then one of the things that I know we've collaborated with yourselves on and more broad, broadly is when you look at the fintech environment um, the FCA regulatory sandbox um, has had um, great success in the UK. It's moving that now internationally, working with the range of other regulators around the world. And I think there's great opportunity to join up in that regard um, in working together. So a few thoughts from us. You can get more of that information from our underlying um, website and our annual review for 2020, which we do in successive years, um, and look forward to the, uh, the discussion that follows um, the next stage of this uh, panel session. So thank you very much, everyone. And as I say, look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, may I ask um, Professor Tobias, Goodman um, to, to join us now. He's advanced to the world of innovation management as an assistant professor of product innovation at EBS Business School and is an expert on corporate venturing. As head of the Institute of Technology, Innovation and Customer Centricity, which is really interesting as opposed to pushing products, it's about understanding customers and manager of the Siemens Product Innovation Lab uh, so his research interests center around corporate venturing, emerging technologies, and new product development. Tobias, welcome to this discussion, and hopefully uh, we can have a great panel after your presentation. Thank you. Yes, 
Thank you and good day, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Um, today, I also want to talk about trends uh, because when I actually look back in my research the last couple of years where I talked to actually a lot of companies, Irene, that you just showed, you know, I investigated, I helped them. So this is really interesting. So I'm also looking forward to the discussion. Uh, so what I see over the last years that many multinational corporations have kind of initiated different various corporate venturing uh, modes and activities uh, and they kind of involved uh, in I call it a, res a kind of a scattered and siloed innovation hodgepodge uh, so many activities which sometimes have overlapping sometimes also conflicting mandates or objectives and approaches which is really interesting so corporates um, do try a lot and this also resulted in what this trend we call innovation theater you know which culminated in corporate innovation programs also failing to achieve sometimes top or bottom line impact. And this is why uh, I give you some insights, uh, trends, uh, I also share a presentation. Uh, if you kind of let me share uh, my, my screen, uh, a small presentation about trends in corporate startup relationships, because I see kind of professionalism taking over this innovation theater. Um, can somebody give me the rights to share my screen, please? I still, the host has deactivated it. Sorry. Um, sorry, I don't have the right. Cecilia, would you be able to? Yeah, this would be perfect. GPS. Still, I cannot, um, now I can do it, perfect. So now you should see my screen. So as I mentioned, uh, trends is really this professionalism taking place. As I mentioned, uh, over the last couple of years, many uh, corporates started building up accelerator programs, hosting hackathons, uh, innovation events, and all that stuff. It was a lot about marketing, it was a lot about trying and building stuff. Uh, Irene just talked about scaling, uh, also Shai talked about the scaling issues. And especially now, it's, uh, it needs to be as professional that you can partner with scale-ups, but also build your own scale-ups. So uh, first thing is a, a nice study which came out recently uh, from 500 startups uh, talking about what are different ways of engaging with startups. And the first one, if you uh, partner with a startup, usually it's a very technical uh, uh, thing. So it's a POC, a proof of concept, which takes days, weeks, sometimes even months, where it's validating if the technology actually works in this corporate environment and also is kind of if your legacy IT and the systems work in collaboration with that startup. Uh, and you also have this hypothesis of trying, okay, does it actually work what you're doing and trying to do with the startup? And then you come to a pilot, a pilot project, which you don't just validate the technology use cases, but you're also trying to incorporate user or customer feedback. Huh? And you also have this hypothesis of will it work in a larger scale uh, um, deployment, which also takes up to months. But then if you go into a production ready uh, system, of course, depends on the industry, yeah? but uh, production takes months, sometimes years in a fully deployable manner. So always keep in mind, it's the same process. If you work with a startup, it's almost the same process as in your own product development processes. Uh, but with those three notions in mind, POC, pilot and production, uh, I see like if you successfully and professionally collaborate with startups on a like enterprise level, enterprise with corporates, then uh, corporates love structure, corporate love processes. And uh, if you want to build up your own startup collaboration unit, uh, I, I would advise to do it like the following steps. You have a setup phase, a discovery phase, an acceleration phase, and a scaling phase. We could hope to talk about scaling. And if, even if you go further and deeper, uh, I don't want to go into detail. I think we can discuss that, but this is what I've seen all along many, many corporates. In the setup phase, of course, you define your strategy. You define search fields where you kind of, how can you look for startups which fit the corporate or the innovation strategy? You set up your team, your operations and so on. In the discovery phase, you, you as a team, a venture team, you try to understand the search fields and the strategy and building up that network in the organizations. You search for startups, you evaluate startups, you negotiate kind of POC or uh, pilot project, and then you shape that 
And then you go into the prototyping phase, transferring it to the business units, structure, scale, sustain. You know, this is the ideal world, yeah? a very process-driven approach. And this is uh, kind of this milestone processes, which all the corporates love to implement. And uh, the different aspect, this is the corporate world. You know, the corporate stakeholders, they have this stage gate process. But then uh, there's a venture unit, like this accelerator, the hub, the open innovation unit, uh, whatever you call it. This is the unit, which is usually part of the corporate but the different uh, third stakeholder is the startup or the scale up or the, the company you want to partner with. And uh, in an ideal world, uh, it's a uh, linear process. But in actually, when, I, when you investigate those processes, that's how it looks like. It's, it's a very, it's a fussy <laughs> and uh, chaotic process. Uh, and this is totally fine because this is how innovation works. But for you, if you're building and establishing a venture unit, uh, which means like the accelerator or startup partner unit, which is here in the middle, then uh, this venture unit needs to translate this creative chaos into that linear process world of the corporate, which is totally fine. So you can like fool the corporate into that process, which makes total sense, but still you need to have the right venture unit, which can translate this chaos into uh, this linear process. But uh, I, I had many startups, uh, I had many corporates to set up such processes because of course there's so much more details there. Uh, but as a professor, of course, I also need to go into academia and this is my almost my last slide. So I, I can give you thousands of blueprints in terms of process and organizations. And this is uh, an old model from the 1980s, uh, talking about what do you need to emerge ventures uh, to build companies. So you need processes, you need the right organization, but you also need the right individuals and the right environment. And especially if you build up such hubs or if you as a corporate want to partner with startups, you focus on the hard facts processes and organizations. And trust me, I can help you bring you thousands of different, <laughs> different ways, but this is not all of it. So uh, this has to do with management, but now we also need to take into account the soft facts, which means the individuals and the environment. Uh, and this is a lot of time forgotten, which means who are the entrepreneurs, who are the, the innovators who actually do the innovation in the corporate and how can you set up the right environment to actually help those innovators thrive. Because when partnering with startups, uh, this is my last word, yeah, no matter who you are, which company you are, most of the smartest people in the world work for someone else. So try to open up and partner with those uh, companies and set up the right operations to be professional in partnering with those startups. And this was my little talk and now I'm really looking forward uh, to connecting you, of course, on LinkedIn and Twitter and so on. And also uh, like discuss with you uh, kind of professionalism taking over innovation theater. Thank you. Irene and, and Tobias, thank you so much for your um, insights into this topic area. Uh, I guess now uh, we should probably uh, see if we can't hear some other voices and get some questions in, into, our, uh, into our fold. Um, but I, what I see is that there's a lot of experience here and um, the direction about trying to involve corporates increasingly. So it's not so much anymore, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. But it sounds to me like I'm from corporate, I'm here to help. So what's the, what's the advantage of that model as opposed to the one that we've all grown up with if we're going to try and pursue, uh, you know, startup to scale up success, do you think? Tobias, you're already unmuted. So I'll ask Irene to join you. Uh, if you I mean, what's the advantage for the scale ups? What's the advantage for society, the, for the corporate that we have this slightly different model going on here. I think, I think um, one of the things we can all reflect on is, is some of the way in which large corporates, if you don't continuously think of yourself as reinventing yourself and thinking entrepreneurially, do not survive or find others that take their, their market share that naturally might have been and should have been theirs. So I think, you know, corporates are increasingly realizing they need innovation into their own mix of, of skill sets and knowledge. And as the buyer said, many of those skill sets and knowledge come from newer and growing and innovative companies. And I think, therefore, the recognition of collaborating with that better is important to the long term survival, sustainability and opportunity for the larger corporate. And I think that's what the shift of recognition is. But Tobias, you'll have a view on that. 
Yeah, totally. In the end, it's uh, of course also this portfolio of innovation activities because not every innovation activity will become a scale up, which is like inherent. Right? And now, not all the activities will become big business. So you need to have this portfolio and bets. You know, you put put your money to different bets and then manage the portfolio with. Uh, okay, you will kill some companies. That's uh, or some projects, which is totally fine. But this is what I mean with the environment. Right? That also should be acceptable that you kill a project after a time. And uh, of course when you when you uh, even if on a corporate or policy level this doesn't uh, is, 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 it applies to the same you know you have this process from ideation to scaling to whatever IPO in a finance landscape um, you should have the right vehicles to also uh, do that and leverage that you know the, the first uh, the early phases is it's totally fine to have it in the universities or in the in the early stage species and later on you also need the corporates you need to have uh, institutions you need to have the right vehicles to really promote and innovation and an end-to-end -end process, which also reflects the notion of size, uh, size uh, innovation uh, chasms, you know, there are many chasms uh, and a lot of times uh, uh, the chasms, they exist because we don't have the right systems integrating the different phases. Yes, your, your chart actually maps beautifully onto, onto the stuff from our book, so thank you very much for doing that <laughs> unplugged. Um, I guess there are two things here when we're looking at trends, you know, what society expecting of us uh, of our startups and scale-ups on the one side and then on the other side a shift in 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 venture capital slash government funding to the corporates becoming more involved so the corporates are, obviously there's one aspect is they need to renew themselves so there's kind of the FOMO fear of missing out on what life might or just having their lunch taken off them basically right and then you know the other side which is saying we need to realign with what society is expecting What's your view on, on things like impact funding coming into this? Because that's trying to address the societal requirements on the one side and trying to connect somehow with the corporates as well, isn't it? So, Irene, are you seeing anything novel or interesting in the impact funding area? Yeah, well, I, well, I think it's just growing exponentially, as is the um, focus on our startup and scale up community on being mm -hmm. social enterprises or um, the range of different you know, B Corps, etc. the whole mix of that purpose led business environment. And I think, um, you know, what you're seeing is more and more investors, um, even traditional investors, deciding on whether they will invest based on the impact, sustainable, green, all of those sort of elements of what the company, the startup and scale up bring. And that, of course, means um, some of the way in which the startup and scale up environment develops will be very focused on that, um, which meets a lot of their, their overall values. But we're seeing impact investing as a, as a whole sort of um, uh, viewpoint uh, increasing we need to see more investors generally I mean I, I was watching uh, the earlier point on on the Hong Kong VC world I mean mm -hmm. we we know in the UK we've got to develop the depth of our capital pool across all the different stages of investment um, and I think uh, inv impact investing is becoming a real core part of that and mainstream as well. Yeah uh, Tobias are you seeing any of that trend across mainland Europe? Uh, I say that with a wry smile, thinking about Brexit here. Apologies. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, absolutely. So what, what I see is uh, the whole ESG trend, you know, that not just investors, institutional, corporate investors, but also private equity firms, of course, uh, emphasizing the whole notion of ESG. What I see in the big corporate, which is interesting, is shifting or reallocating budgets uh, for ESG into also investing. Uh, for example, the big insurance companies, um, they need to signal to the market that they kind of more, much more sustainable. This is why they have sustainable projects uh, which they, they fund. And now they we are locating those budgets into their corporate venture capital arms and now try to invest in like, if a big insurance company with many billions of their assets as an asset management, if they reallocate only like one or two percent of their <laughs> this money into like venture funds and uh, investing into like sustainable ESG companies, this uh, this will have a huge impact. And I've seen that, and also have been debating this with many many organizations in Europe. Uh, so this is something which is really interesting. Also, if you only track all the big uh, consulting companies like BCG, McKinsey, like almost every second week, I see a new report out with ESG investing, impact investing. So it's it's really kind of the new trend. Uh, and I hope it's not just a trend which they use for signaling uh, innovativeness or uh, greenwashing marketing stuff, but actually uh, like 
yes. doing that yeah, and, uh, and implementing. That's a really interesting topic because it kind of came up with uh, our, uh, Tony from uh, Gobi uh, as well, you know, about uh, the, the GBA area. And Irene, you've been there, the idea that they're a sustainable, uh, eco-friendly environment. And um, see more and more companies claiming to be doing that thing. And of course, you talked about greenwashing. I watched a rather horrific uh, documentary on Netflix last night, and I think there's a term blue washing coming through as well, where oceans are being ripped apart. So, the, and, and I'm wondering whether impact funding is, is again, is a fashion thing to say right now. So you're just doing exactly the same thing as before, but just putting a different cover on it, or whether people are genuinely actually trying to make an impact. And uh, I, think that comes back I, I haven't, sorry, world. Irene, go ahead. That comes back to the global political world as well, yes. the world of countries. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we're hosting the, the COP later this year in the UK, but I think this is about, you know, if, if it aligns at the global geopolitical environment, then through. And my sense is it will. And I think that's goes back to Tobias's points. This is big, big corporates, big investors, big insurers, all looking at this ESG issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, I, if, I, if I can also can piggyback on that, Shai, sorry for that, uh, because it's really interesting. What we have in Germany is uh, we have a venture fund, which is partially funded by the government and partially funded by uh, like institutional and corporate investors. And especially they focus on like the early stage, like seed and series A. And uh, what I'd love to see uh, in, in any company or any, any, um, in any country, such venture funds, which uh, they invest in their local startups, but also where they then have as, as, a, uh, as a barrier, you know, they, or they allocate so much of their funding into like ESG investments. This would be, this would be fantastic. Yeah. Bearing in mind our hosts are from Hong Kong, we should um, turn to the, the topic of how do we see either British uh, slash European startups and scale-ups engaging with the agenda that the Innovation Forum is hosting today. I'm wondering whether either of you has a, a, a view well, on what that. What we see is, I mean, you know, our, our scale-up community absolutely wants to go global. I mean, Irene talks about generally sort of the trends that, that you're seeing in Hong Kong, and, and certainly it mirrors our own ambitions of our UK scale-up economy. They want to go global, and they are looking far more at Hong Kong, China, the broader Asia than just Europe and, and the US. And I think that's really important. So I think that opportunity to collaborate across borders with each other is really important. And it's also really important what, what Hong Kong's building in that kind of central um, hub of the Innovation Forum as well, in terms of signaling their welcomeness to scale ups coming into, into the market there and being the gateway. I think, you know, that, that phrasing of the gateway into China, it's a, it's a great landing spot for UK businesses. And I think that's something we need to build up on and, and you know, working with our innovation agency and yourselves. But certainly we see great opportunities there. And I know our scale ups do. Tobias, you'll have a view from a European. Yeah, what I, especially now with COVID times, uh, the world is becoming smaller and smaller. <laughs> uh, I see now with this virtual operating model, uh, I have been working over, uh, virtually for the last five years. So for me, it's nothing new, but I see now that, that, that it's just a new normal. So I think this is now a really cool opportunity to engage globally and the whole innovation ecosystem uh, is a very fruitful and open space. Uh? So really becoming part of this open innovation ecosystem and community, I think is pretty cool. And I think this is also an opportunity now to open up uh, uh, there's no barriers uh, of course culturally language but we all we all can communicate and I think this is a huge opportunity to tap into kind of this uh, innovation ecosystem so there's a question on in the chat line uh, but Cecilia I'm going to ask you whether we have time for one more question or did you want to wrap up at this point um, if we, we can uh, take this uh, question quickly, if that's okay, and then we can uh, wrap up because we're coming to time. Certainly, but... certainly. While Irene and, and Tobias are looking at the, at the question, just thinking also, what would be the, the next first three steps we might want to take to, to link uh, more effectively with the Innovation Forum in Hong Kong and ourselves across here in the UK and Europe to, to enable this vision that uh, that Cecilia and her colleagues have brought to the table. But first, let's answer the question. 
Yeah, no, and, and a really good question, I think, in the chat room as well. Um, look, I think it, I mean, this is partly what we've got to change as well as the mindset of the corporate. Um, they need to be far more thinking entrepreneurial as well, and also making it more simple and easy for any startup to, to engage. It is... Um, <laughs> quite a difficult as we said it's a complex process and our startups tell us that so making sure that there is um very open communication i think just picking up the point made here um the worst thing is when a startup or scale up business is, business is putting resource towards building a relationship with a corporate and the corporate perhaps knows they're not going to work with them but takes a long time telling the business yeah. Yeah, I agree. That is the worst thing in all senses. So it has to be done openly and quickly if actually the collaboration is not going to work. Too often there's a kind of desire to sometimes keep the dialogue going, knowing that actually nothing is going to materialise. But that's one of the views I'd have, Tobias. Absolutely, uh, Irene. Though, just before you answer, Tobias, just before I forget that I did some work with Microsoft and a whole bunch of companies on the West Coast on this topic area. And one of the PowerPoint slides I came up with, which probably did befriend me to many of them was the corporate view is yes, 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 no. Right, so the expectation. The VCs, on the other hand, 95 presentations after no, 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 eventually get something going. So it's a different uh, approach. But Tony Watson, a former colleague of mine up at Nottingham, uh, he had a lovely academic paper which said there's a fatal distinction when you separate entrepreneurship and management because entrepreneurs can't just wander around waving their arms, they need some discipline. Equally, managers who don't open their minds to this possibility are also making a fatal error. So entrepreneurship needs to be an integral part of management, not some kind of left-wing, right-wing uh, agenda. Whether we can ever get that through <laughs> to corporates and the systems, Tobias, you would you like to answer that question? I think you, we should differentiate the, the, the type of partnership. So if you if a startup wants to become a supplier or a partner of, of, a, of a big corporate, um, this whole notion of fail fast and fail often, uh, I think that that's not really true because professional startups, of course, uh, failing fast and failing often, but uh, everyone hates failing. Also, the, the, the good startups hate hate failing. And if you partner, or like if your business model uh, includes a corporate, then you should be professional enough to work with them. You should be funded well enough uh, to kind of... Uh, uh, be, have patient capital <laughs> and uh, but if, you, if your business model is around selling to corporates or whatever then your sales process will take long long, long time so uh, I, if you're professional enough in the scaling phase especially uh, you need to be as professional in partnering with those and uh, in, in also my in my research and also I used to work in, in a big corporate partnering with startups partnering or in, in, and or investing in startups and it was never a cultural issue uh, it was always it's it's always uh, if the startup is uh, is professional, and also the corporate is professional in handling those issues. Uh, the venture unit, as I mentioned, the middle layer uh, connecting the two worlds. Uh, it's it's really uh, the role of this uh, venture unit, which translate the venture world to the startup world with the corporate world. And I think this is this is key for success. A fascinating uh, chat, Ruby. Hopefully, Cecilia, we succeed in your vision of connecting the two worlds because we would love to learn about how Hong Kong businesses do this and how the Chinese businesses solve the same, same problem. So maybe there can be a repeat match at some point where we hear from, from your, your friends across uh, in that part of the world. Thank you very much for inviting myself and to have Tobias and Irene on the panel as well. Thank you both. Hand Thank back. you very much, Shine, for chairing an excellent panel. All the insights and points are very interesting and attractive. Uh, may I, I would like to pass the floor to Iwan. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm just uh, adding myself. So thank you very much. It's uh, been very, like really interesting. And there's a lot of points for the Innovation Forum in general to uh, take forward from, uh, from this webinar, both in terms of looking at the, the scale up um, uh, ecosystem and how do we feed those startups to like um, to look into like the um, their progression into the say, like ecosystem and corporate I'm partnering with corporates that can really take their uh, ideas forward in a like with substance rather than say fact like the going with the the trends in like a more of a fashionable thing really looking at the substance of where are these trends actually leading how do we actually feed into that into a, a wider um uh, wider perspective and try to connect with each other 
And um, yeah, thank you very much for all the speakers. It's been really, uh, really interesting to see so many opportunities that are arising between sort of the main uh, European focus of uh, IF with the, the Hong Kong um, ecosystem, because I think there's a lot of opportunities there um, for us to make the most of. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Cecilia, who's done a great job in um, putting all of this together uh, and uh, organizing this because it's been, yeah, uh, a lot of work I know on, on her side and it's been, uh, yeah, very well organized. So thank you much. And I'll pass on to Cecilia for final yeah. remarks. Thank you, Ewan. So in closing, I would like to thank all the speakers for sharing your insights at macro and micro levels about the trends of investing in tech startups. Um, your views should shed light on how companies should capture opportunities in Hong Kong, the Greater Bay Area in China, and I would say uh, we need to consider the Asia Pacific and on a global scale as well. And also our sincere thanks to Professor Shai Waikanum for chairing the panel together with Professor Go Goodman and Ms. Graham. And um, their insights have illustrated principles of corporate venturing and offered some very good examples from European and UK perspectives. I would say today's webinar is a very good start for the Innovation Forum Hong Kong to pursue related topics in a systematic manner. And we look forward to uh, collaborating with corporates uh, and, and the scale-up institutes and universities in the UK and Europe. 